Good evening and welcome to our keynote speech by Professor Nigel Duncan. So Professor Duncan is Professor Emeritus of Legal Education at the City Law School at uh, the City of City University London. And Professor Duncan is a National Teaching Fellow, Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. In addition, Professor Duncan is a member of the Education and Training Committee of the Bar Standards Board. Uh, the advisory uh, is advisory council to the Academic and Professional Development Committee of the International Bar Association and a director of the International Association of Legal Ethics. Professor Duncan has an editorial role with a number of journals in the field of legal education. There's a list of them, but just the top of the list, the law teacher, but several others. And Professor Duncan has also played a leading role in a number of legal education initiatives. And some of these are detailed in the abstract of Professor Duncan's talk. He is, for example, co-founder of the International Forum on Teaching Legal Ethics and Professionalism. And this is a website designed as an interactive resource and forum for those interested in the education and training of professionals. You can find the URL in the abstract for, for this paper. As always, if you've got any questions, could you please send them to me via chat? And then I'll pose them to Professor Duncan later. So Professor Duncan's paper sets out a framework for supporting the well-being of law students. And he argues that legal education should support student well-being and a positive professional identity for lawyers. Professor Duncan's paper is entitled Resilience, Well-being and, and Preparation for Professional Practice. So welcome, Professor Duncan. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, can I check that everyone can hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Yep, great. OK, well, thank you very much for the invita invitation to uh, to give a, a keynote at this conference. Great conference and uh, a great series of conferences. And so congratulations to the Chinese University of Hong Kong for organizing these. Um, I'm speaking from London. We have uh, uh, a, a bright, dry day, mixture of blue sky and clouds. It's really quite pleasant, about 21 degrees. So uh, that's that's where I am here, and um, it's very good to be speaking from you to you. And can I say in particular thanks to Michael for um, inviting me and for organising this. Michael, it's good to see you again. Um, it, it's an honour to be invited to give this address, and um, I, I'd like to start by. <clears throat> excuse me, noticing that uh, when I was looking through the programme, I saw that uh, Natalie and I both had uh, titles that suggested we might have a little bit of overlap. And we have been in touch with each other, and uh, I think we, we confirmed that uh, there was nothing that was going to be too repetitive. So I hope you'll bear with the, the small amount of overlap that, that does exist. Um, I, I was listening to at Natalie's presentation as I was coming in on the train to work this morning. Um, and actually, there are a couple of things that particularly um, stood out to me that I would really like to endorse. I mean, one is her concept of preparing the whole lawyer. We, we, we're complex people and it's a complex environment that, that we live within. And I, I also liked, and forgive me, because I was on the train, I couldn't take a note very easily. But I think, Natalie, you, you talked about empowered, ethically directed, and good-hearted people. And certainly that, that, I hope, is what we can contribute to preparing in our, in our work in law schools. Now, I'm going to try and, uh, now whereabouts is, here's the share screen thing. Um, Um, I just okay. Can everyone see my my screen? Yes, we can, Nigel. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Okay. Well, my my title, as you see, um, Michael's already explained, is resilience, well-being, and preparation for professional practice. Um, 
that covers a lot of ground and, I, and I'm conscious that I am going to be covering quite a lot of ground. What, what I've done, um, I pro I've probably prepared too much stuff and I've referred to uh, a lot of the work that other people have done. Um, you will find at the end of this, uh, this slideshow, three slides of references. So if people are motivated to follow up what I'm uh, addressing here, you should find access to all those. And um, I, I know that these are being recorded um, and I take it and certainly I can send a copy of the slides uh, to you if it's helpful to have it um, available in, in, in that way. Okay, so um, let, let's get going. First of all, this. It was shortly after I'd been asked to give this presentation that I saw this from a bar student, Catherine Bupinder on Twitter. Now I've got in touch with her and she's given me permission to share this with you at this conference and to mention her name. This is the course I teach on. Can I say, I'm very glad that Catherine did not study at our institution. I hope, I, I really think that we provide a better student experience than that and a more supportive student experience than that. But this addresses the first part of my, my talk, which is to look at student well-being. I'll go on to look at the transition to professional practice, which was more the area that, that Natalie referred to um, in, in a few minutes. For those of you who are not familiar, I imagine many of you are, in the UK, students study a three-year undergraduate law degree, or they study a, a degree in another discipline and then do generally a, a one-year conversion course where um, you know, the, the core subjects are covered. And they then go on to do a professional course, different courses depending on whether they're going to go to the bar or the solicitor's profession. And my experience has been with the bar. The, the majority of my life. Um, okay, so let's move on and I will introduce this to you. This is from a research report produced by Lydia Bleasdale and Sarah Humphreys at Leeds University. This was a research project looking at students across a number of different disciplines, including law. And I'll give you a moment to read it. I know that's just far too much information on one slide. What I'd like to draw to your attention is the distinction that they're drawing there between university being a developmental challenge both an academic and a personal level, which frankly is what it should be. If there's no developmental challenge, then students will not develop, they, they will not learn, or at least we won't be helping them to learn. But also to consider whether there are any challenges that are unnecessary, that may inhibit development. So they're trying to look at that distinction to look at whether there are challenges that we find ourselves imposing on our students, probably unintentionally, that we're pretty well motivated on the whole, that may in fact impede their development into the, the whole lawyer that Natalie was talking about earlier on. Uh, there's a reference, there's a link there and a reference to the full report um, at the end of these slides. So there are a number of things that I think that we can do which help to encourage developmental challenge, but reduce some of the unnecessary challenges that we currently may be imposing on our students. And the first area I'd like to look into is the whole area of curriculum design. You're probably familiar with the concept of constructive alignment. Um, many, many layers analysis have gone into that, but I'm going to present it very simply as making sure that the 
whole learning experience is constructive and developmental. And in particular, and it's a point I'll return to, that the way our students learn is aligned with the way in which we assess them. And I'm asking you a number of questions. First of all, are you building progressively on students learning in respect of content, the law they're learning, the intellectual demands, if I could put it this way, how, how difficult that is. And also, what are the skills we're expecting them to demonstrate as they learn? And with that in mind, over the years, however many years they are, of the degree that our students are working on, we need to develop a progressive curriculum. Now, that's not easy. We all have our subject areas that we like to teach and we like to ensure that they're taught in the way that we think is best for our subject. This requires a degree of cooperation and planning of the curriculum that uh, a number of my colleagues sometimes find they want to resist. And I'm sure those of you who've been involved with management of a law degree will recognize how difficult this can be. Herding cats comes to mind. Um, but we are colleagues, we're working together on developing the most effective student learning experience, and we need to grasp those challenges. My second main bullet, this addresses the, uh, the risk that I've seen it so often that our students are learning through one type of activity and then they're being assessed through something different. And the classic unseen three hour examination is an example of this. It seems to me that we ought to be devising methods of assessment that relate to the ways in which students are learning. Now, it may be, of course, that most of the learning is very assessment focused and assessment driven. And there may be limits, and this is what I'm about to come to in the next bullet, to the sort of assessment that we, uh, we require of our students. Certainly, I find on the bar course that there are areas where the externally imposed assessments, we have a regulator, the Bar Standards Board, that has centrally set assessments in a number of areas. And the consequence of these on our students' learning, in my view, has sometimes been damaging. In essence, these are multiple choice tests. They're presented as best answer questions, and there's some justice to that. Multiple choice questions don't need to be simplistic. And these are serious and demanding, thoughtful questions. But we found that in order to ensure that our students are as best prepared as possible for those assessments, we need to design learning approaches that focus on getting them good answering that sort of question and we have to spend more time on it. We can therefore spend less time on developing their ability to challenge and to critique the law that they face and the impact that the law has on society around them. So the learning outcomes, sorry, the assessment approach has a major impact on the learning. And in terms of what we demand, and this may be unrealistic, it may be ineffective, we need to go back to our regulators and perhaps the potential employers who currently have so much influence on us and get them to think hard about how much they really want to impose particular methods of assessment. So this outcomes approach is one that I, I think is problematic and I finally want to address how you actually give a grade. Do you look at the performance that the student has had, come up with a specific assessment of that performance, in other words, uh, a criterion referenced assessment, and thus give justice to however the student has actually performed? Or do you instead, as is the normal practice in some jurisdictions, and not just in particular in the United States, do you assess them on a bell curve? A norm level, a norm reference assessment of this sort uh, encourages extrinsic motivation, whereas a 
uh, an effective criterion restaurant assessment encourages intrinsic motivation. Frankly, and I'm gonna state my view bluntly, assessing on a bell curve is unfair. You're not assessing that student's performance, you're assessing how they rate with the, the cohort they happen to be in. It's not fair. And in my view, we should stop it. I'm going to spend a few moments on something that Natalie mentioned briefly. This is a self-determination theory. Um, it's a research-based theory of positive psychology. And I found it really helpful in developing both constructive curricula and learning methods. You'll see there that there are three key components and I'll, I'll adjust them separately in a moment, but these in effect are the needs that all of us have in order to thrive. Competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And our ability to help students with those key needs is significant in the extent to which we are able to support or thwart their intrinsic motivation. Uh, and I'll return to that as well in a moment. So first, competence. I'll give you a moment to read those quotes and forgive me for uh, a self-reference. I quite liked what we'd put there. Developing student competence really lies at the heart of all we do, doesn't it? Um, this is what we are trying to achieve with our students. And I think that uh, very few people would challenge that. This relates to the student's cognitive abilities, their analytical abilities, their critical faculty, and also to the related skills that enable them to exercise and apply that, those cognitive abilities. It probably also links to a number of other skills, the skills that relate to their ability to communicate, to persuade and to advise. Now we need to feel capable of achieving whatever we set out to achieve. That's why competence is so important to us. And therefore the demands we make through our curriculum should be progressive. It really isn't helpful to throw students in at the deep end. Moving on to autonomy, we've defined that as acting in accordance with one's values. Now, it seems to me that there, there is a number of ways in which we can uh, assist students to experience an autonomous learning environment. And we can do that partly by giving students greater say in what they actually study. Now, again, this may not be within our control. Natalie was talking about the Priestly Eleven. Uh, there are core subjects that are either identified as core, or as in the United Kingdom, through the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, uh, also set their own examinations, identify areas that everyone has to learn because they've got to pass the examinations. If we can give students as much personal choice as possible, so to minimize that call, to give as much choice for electives as possible, we can increase their autonomy. And to the extent that we don't have control over that at the moment, this, it's important for us to continue to have a, a discourse with the regulators that control our work and with the practitioners, the professionals who, uh, who influence it. We can give students some autonomy in respect of how they study, and, and that's involved with providing diverse learning resources. And this is perhaps a bit more controversial. We can give them some degree of autonomy in how they're assessed. One university where I act as an external uh, examiner at the moment is beginning to introduce students having the ability to identify their own 
essay titles. Uh, those essay titles have to be discussed and approved by their tutors. And the process of actually getting those approved is a wonderful learning experience. And it seems to me to provide an effective assessment approach. It also fits nicely with the constructive alignment that I was talking about earlier. So it has to be moderated by staff, but it's certainly a way of improving autonomy. And there's also something about encouraging open debate in our discussions. So rather than simple didactic teaching, we encourage discussion and we take students' own views seriously. Even if we've got very good reasons for disagreeing with them, that has to be done with uh, a respectful approach. Thirdly, talking about relatedness. Operating in a warm environment. Let, let me tell you an experience that I had in my very first year of teaching in higher education. I had been asked to take tutorials in employment law on a law degree. And the lecture, lecturer, who was uh, eminent, was going to provide the lectures. So I went on to sit in uh, the first lecture. I can't remember the subject now, but partway through, a student stuck up his hand and asked a question. Now, it wasn't a stupid question, but it was clear that the student hadn't understood the point that the lecturer was making. So it was a good question. It was designed for the student to understand what he didn't know. The lecturer looked down at the student. He was on a high podium. And his lip curled. He sneered. He didn't say a thing. Then he looked back up at the lecture room and simply carried on lecturing. And I determined at that moment that I would never, ever treat a student in that way. So what can we do to uh, help to provide a warm learning environment? Um, first of all, we, we need to find a way of combining being an authority with being approachable, both in class and outside it. And of course, there's going to be pressure on our time. It may be that we need to limit the times when students have access to it and we have other parts of our jobs that we have to do. But when we are interacting with students, a warm, approachable uh, method is, is absolutely key. It's also important for us to help students to get to know each other. Um, so we think about support for students' organizations, support for student social life. We also need to have effective personal support. I mean, one of the things that's been great about teaching on the bar course, which is a one-year course, is that we are able to organize that every student has a personal tutor who also teaches them. So you really get to know them, you see them on a regular basis. And um, that makes your job as a personal tutor very much easier. Some obvious things, students need to have the confidence that if they're going to raise an issue which is confidential, it will stay confidential. Um, we also need to make sure that the university provides effective counselling and support services, um, probably within the law school, but also there will be generic counselling and support across the university, and we need to ensure that the people providing that understand the particular issues that affect law students. Okay, so there's a brief word about the three needs and how we can support our students and provide them with an environment in which they, that those are maximized. Um, a quick word about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. These come from the work of Krieger and Sheldon who've uh, looked at this and looked at self-determination theory in particular in relation to law students. I really recommend their articles to you. You'll probably gather that I'm presenting intrinsic motivation as a good, 
and extrinsic motivation, well, not as a bad. Frankly, it's always seemed to me that any motivation is better than none. But think back to the three needs, and in particular, the need for autonomy. If your only motivation is extrinsic, it's being imposed upon you from outside, this immediately challenges your ability to be um, autonomous. Now, we can thwart or we can support intrinsic motivation. And Krieger and Sheldon's advice helps us to devise ways in which we can help our students to thrive. So, for an example, we can support it through providing timely, regular, constructive feedback, what the educationalists often describe as feed forward. And we can thwart it through setting up an over-competitive environment in our law school. Now, what I, uh, what I want to do next is to look at the ways in which we prepare our students. This is covering some of the same ground. Through these five points, we need to think about our interactions with them. The point is that we must be approachable and supportive, particularly if necessary, that that's not inconsistent with approachable and supportive. The curriculum design needs to be expressive, progressive, I'm sorry. We need to think about ways of encouraging autonomy through the learning activities. And my suggestion is that the experiential learning activities are the best at getting a, an autonomous approach to your learning, which combines cognitive and skill development. We need to assess in a way which is appropriate to the learning that students have been doing, and we need to develop a reflective approach, and so do students. So from our point of view, we need to keep an open mind and continue to reflect on the effectiveness of what we're doing. From students' perspective, we need to encourage them to develop a reflective practice. And we can do that, for instance, by incorporating reflection into our assessments. And I've found that to have a huge effect on the way in which my students learn. Okay, now I'm going to move to the second part of my presentation, which relates to preparing students for the transition to practice. This is a huge change for students. It's something that Natalie addressed to a considerable extent, and I don't want to cover the same ground as she did. And what I'm going to suggest is, I think this is consistent with what she was saying, that in addition to learning the law and learning the skills that are necessary to apply the law, we need to add these three things. First of all, we need to add insight, and that, if you like, is real knowledge and understanding of what practice is really like. Now, they may um, have all sorts of ideas of what practice is like. Some of it comes from the television and is probably very misleading. They may have uh, internship experiences. They may have all sorts of experiences which we haven't control of. Um, it seems to me that the element of um, realistic learning activities, those that use simulations perhaps, can be effective to a degree, and uh, I think it can be helpful also to have clinical methods where they can be effective. Um, secondly, self-awareness. Self-awareness of their own personal and moral development. This involves the affective domain, the emotional domain, as much as it does the cognitive domain. And again, I would argue that experiential learning methods are probably the best for working at this. I, I'll return to this later. Um, also, moral courage. 
it can be tough when you see something that you think is wrong taking place and when you're in a very junior position to stand up and to be counted. And again, this is an area that we need to spend some time thinking about. What I'd like to give you now is a brief example of an attempt to do some of this on the bar course on which I teach uh, at City University. And I want to say a little bit about the, um, the way in which we operate clinical programs uh, within, our, within our course. These are designed to address the challenges that are inherent in legal practice. Now, inevitably, clinical programs are usually working not in the commercial field, but in the field where students are encountering clients who are in difficulties of some sort. So this is not addressing the commercial issues that Natalie was to a degree talking about. What we provide is a number of different clinics, some of which involve advice, but the two that I want to talk about here involve students working with real clients and they work through one or two charities. The free representation unit, as you see, this provides full representation service in tribunal hearings. Now, since the pandemic, most of those tribunal hearings have been online and most of the work that students do with their clients is also online. The two areas in which we work are with employment tribunals and social security tribunals. The National Centre for Domestic Violence works with the victims of domestic violence through telephone interviews. Students don't take these matters to court, they don't have um, the, uh, the right to do so but they prepare court documentation, the necessary forms, and they work with their clients to prepare witness statements to take their matters to court. Now, when you think about this area of work, you can see that these clients are probably facing one of the worst things that they've ever experienced in their lives. Domestic violence speaks for itself. The employment cases, these people have lost their jobs or they've suffered unlawful discrimination. They're probably unable now to provide effectively for their families and the level of personal undermining that takes place when you lose your job is enormous. The social security tribunals are mostly addressing uh, people who have disabilities <clears throat> and who have either had their disability benefits taken away from them or have been denied them when they applied. So as you see, these are all clients who are facing huge emotional challenges. And my first example um, is going to be from a focus group, I've held regular focus groups with the students at the end of their year to explore their experience of these options. My first example is uh, from uh, a student who was working with the National Centre for Domestic Violence. And this is what she said, I'll give you a moment to read that. So I hope you can see what a difficult situation this is. The student is working with a client who has suffered domestic violence and is seeking the opportunity to continue to look after her children. But if the children are at risk, what may happen is that the authorities will take the children away from her. And the student has identified that her account is inconsistent. So you can see the conflict that this is faced. The student needs to support her client. She needs to continue to be non judgmental, but ultimately she has to advise in the client's best interests. And here the story clearly is not true. 
And that doesn't mean that the client is lying, of course. She's under enormous stress. And when you're faced with such difficult emotional challenges, they arise from the emotional challenges that your client is facing. This is perhaps an example of a vicarious trauma. And there's no easy answer to this. What the student in fact did in these circumstances is uh, refer the matter to her supervisor, who is an experienced uh, lawyer, family lawyer, who was able to take over and help. Now, this is not the only area where uh, challenges faced. Here's, this was an example of a challenge arising from the client. Here's an example of a challenge arising from the bench. This was a social security tribunal. The bench is composed of three people. The chair is a qualified lawyer. There's a doctor with mental health experience in this case. And there'll be a lay person as well. The client in this case was facing removal of disability benefits. She had a diagnosis of mental illness, but the benefits had been refused. Again, I'll let you read. So I imagine you can see that the student was faced with a, a difficult ethical dilemma here. Should he have gone to support the distressed client? Or should he stay to, to challenge the injustice of what was being done? Now, once again, I don't think there's a correct answer to that question. This is what he actually did. So it worked, the challenge worked. And I applaud that, but at the same time, the client was left sobbing in the waiting room or wherever she'd gone. The student didn't know where she'd gone. And that may have been the better thing to do. So I, I hope you can see that by providing clinical experiences of, of this sort, we can help to prepare students. And I wouldn't want to dump students into situations like this without giving them some practice first. And so what we operate through is simulations where they're working in class, doing realistic things, uh, which help to prepare. And then only once they've had that experience, um, doing some work with real clients. And we also give them preparation. So, um, we run a number of workshops, including workshops on things like professional empathy, for example, which may have helped with the first example I've given. So these are methods that we might use to help students to meet those encounters, which I, I suggest to you are pretty much inherent in, uh, in a lot of areas of practice. But for some of our students, there's something, something rather darker waiting for them. Now, I really regret that this guy is still in the news in the way that he is. The guy he's speaking to, Kirill Dmitriev, is, as you see, the CEO of the Russian Fund for Direct Investment. This is the organization that uh, organizes the investments for the Putin-supporting oligarchs. At the bottom, I've given you a link to a Transparency International campaign to counter the, uh, the, the dirty money that the Russian kleptocrats, you, you may be interested in following that up. Um, my concern here is the question of who actually enables these guys to do what they do. You'd all recognize Vladimir Putin. Um, you may recognize Roman Abramovich, who um, is until recently the owner of Chelsea Football Club. He's also uh, one of the oligarchs who's recently been sanctioned as a result of the 
illegal invasion of Ukraine. The point I want to make is that lawyers are always involved in enabling these guys. The quote at the bottom, this comes from uh, a statement by a UK MP in the House of Commons. And he identified three lawyers, all working for well-established, highly respected firms as working for oligarchs who back Vladimir Putin's regime. Now, he was able to say that under the law of absolute privilege, um, and I claim the law of qualified privilege because I do this as a simple report of what was said in the House of Commons. So some of your students, when they enter in particular commercial practice, are going to find that they are asked to do things they may feel really uncomfortable about. And on the other hand, they are the professionals with serious responsibilities. So how do we help them to counter corruption? In principle, this is what they're meant to be doing. After all, it's lawyers who prosecute and defend those who are accused of fraud and corruption. They advise companies who are considering actions that some may regard as corrupt. And for some of our students, they'll be working in-house in those companies. They advise and they act for government and for regulators. So in all these areas, they are expected to be meeting these high standards. So how do we most effectively prepare them to, to meet this uh, potentially corrupt environment? Now, I think there are problems if we simply teach the law. One of the problems is the tendency to treat a professional code of conduct in the way that we encourage our students to approach statutory law. Can we find a way of interpreting our way around that provision or find a way through between provisions. Is it right to do that? I mean, that's an interesting question to put to your students. A great opportunity for learning about these things. And, and we may legitimately take different views about it. I would say that codes of conduct probably shouldn't be treated in quite the same way as legislation. If we only teach the law, it fails to develop the four capacities in these bullets here, to recognize ethical dilemmas, to analyze, justify ethical decisions, to internalize and adopt professional values, or to implement the ethically proper response. I will return to those four bullets in a few moments. I, I mentioned at the bottom there, the Carnegie Report, Educating, educating Lawyers. Um, that's a, a useful, Rotation, we cannot avoid providing our students with a moral apprenticeship. If we ignore these issues, that's exactly what we're teaching them to do. One of the things that um, I've prepared is a case study. This case study focuses on whistleblowing. Does anyone recognize this lady? Um, I'm conscious it's difficult with you muted for you to respond. So um, this is Erin Brockovich Ellis. She was a US paralegal and an environmental activist. And in 1983, she was working for the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And some of their activities were poisoning a particular community. Um, you may, some of you are a similar age to me at least, have seen the movie that was made about her with Julia Roberts playing the part of Erin Brockovich, well, this, this is the real person. What's interesting about her is that she used both the law and her insider status in the organization to blow the whistle and to alert people to what happened. She's definitely a hero and her 
uh, whistleblowing attempt was successful. However, it often isn't. Whistleblowing is a dangerous activity and one which often leads people to come unstuck. Here is a real life hero. This guy is Osita Mba. He is a solicitor who some 12 years ago was working for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in London. HMRC, as it's called, is the, uh, it's the finance uh, arm of the United Kingdom government. Now, Ambar turned whistleblower in 2010 to 11 when he noticed something pretty dubious going on. Here's what happened. And again, I'll give you a moment to, to read that. I'll interject at a couple of points. The senior government official that I mentioned there was David Hartsnett. He at the time was the head of HMRC. Goldman Sachs, you'll be familiar with the big accountancy firm. The reference to a protected disclosure there, um, this is a concept under the UK's Public Interest Disclosure Act of 1998, which provides a degree of protection, but only a degree, to whistleblowers. The Public Accounts Committee is a select committee of the House of Commons. And as you see, when they investigated the matter, here are all the consequences, the, the uh, conclusions that they came to. And when the matter was investigated by the National Audit Office, they agreed that procedures hadn't been followed. They proposed new measures to strengthen legal controls and governance. More of that later. And, and in the popular press, there was widespread condemnation of these unfair treatments, rich companies were being let off paying tax, whereas ordinary taxpayers had to pay everything that was due. So all that sounds positive, but there was another side to all this. Government ministers and the investigation um, of the Public Accounts Committee discovered that actually it was government ministers that had supported David Hartnett in giving this special deal to Goldman Sachs, even though it lost the Exchequer 10 million pounds. Those same government ministers encouraged the authorities to carry out an investigation of the bar under anti-terrorist laws of all things. Needless to say, the bar didn't carry out any terrorist activities, but he was suspended from his job and he's never got it back. The, uh, the National Audit Office never introduced the independent controls over private settlements that they referred to. HMRC themselves argued and consistently argued that taxpayer confidentiality overrode transparency. As a result of the popular press discussion of this, the government talked about introducing a new offence of aggressive tax avoidance. Uh, that's not been implemented. The most recent report um, on it came out last year, in 2021, and um, still not implemented. A charity called UK Uncut took judicial review against HMRC on this. That judicial review said, yes, everything bar correct, but the claim actually failed because the court held that this was only maladministration. And what happened to the two protagonists? Hartnett retired from HMC and got a revolving door job, I'll explain that in a moment, with HSBC. By contrast, Mbar no longer works from HMRC. And a couple of years ago, he tried to get another job with HMRC. He was 
rejected in spite of his experience and his qualifications, brought an employment tribunal claim, arguing that this was uh, discriminating against him because of his protected disclosure, but lost it. He, the tribunal concluded that he could not establish that connection. Incidentally, one of the things that we discover when we um, look at the relationship between people in senior government positions is that often they spend some time in a government position then, particularly in a, an organization like HMRC, they then go into a job with a big bank or a big city firm, and maybe they have picked up a lot of very useful information about the legislation they've helped devise, which helps their new employers to, uh, to work. So the, the revolving door concept is, uh, is a significant feature, and I'm sure it's not just the UK that has that. So it's a cautionary tale in a way. Uh, and Barr suffered seriously from, it seems to me, doing the right thing, and whistleblowers very often do. Now, there is a wonderful resource to help us with the content of uh, the, the law on corruption. It's present, prepared by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. It's the uh, academic initiative for education for justice. There's a link to it, and it's great. But knowledge isn't enough. And what I want to spend the last few slides on is looking at some of the other things that we need to address. And this is harking back to those four bullets I, I mentioned earlier on. And here I want to introduce you to the work of James Rest and his four component model of morality. He identified four predictors of professional misconduct. The first is moral blindness in effect, not noticing that there's a problem. Secondly, faulty reasoning. The, the inability, if you like, to, to think through the problem and to develop solutions for it. Lack of motivation, which may arise from, from laziness, from fear of the powerful, maybe one's own personality traits, or fourthly, ineffectiveness. And this could arise from character weaknesses of one's own or, or the lack of problem solving, analytical or communication skills to be effective. Now, James Rest argued that any of these can contribute to professional misconduct. So we've got to address all of them. He also provides some suggestions as to how we might present, uh, address them. And here they are. So with moral sensitivity, we need to address the capacity to interpret ambiguous clues in the real life settings. This seems to me to be right for experiential work. As far as judgment is concerned, this is where a development of cognitive abilities is absolutely crucial. Moral motivation. We need to help our students to recognize their own character elements. This is an emotional issue, and we need to encourage them to adopt the professional ethical culture and to achieve moral courage. Finally, implementation. Again, competence for empathic interaction, again, very much an area for the effective domain, not merely the, uh, not merely the cognitive domain, and again, one which I think is ripe for experiential learning. So all of these require getting students to recognize and think about our dilemmas and to learn experientially. And this is my final substantive slide. Here are some suggestions as to how these experiential methods might work. Um, Stephen Hartwell, he discovered that by having highly interactive seminars, he had a strong positive impact on students' moral judgment. And I should make the point that um, 
He wasn't telling students what to believe, but getting them to practice on realistic dilemmas. Muriel Bebo, working with professional dentists, she produced a, a comprehensive ethics curriculum and she found that it had a significant impact on student scores on the defining issues test. That, by the way, is a, a, a test of moral development, which is based on the work of Lawrence Kohlberg. And again, I put references at the end. Finally, Mary Gentile, very well known, her work on giving voice to values. Um, this is used quite a lot in uh, legal education. And basically it's a method well established of helping individuals to speak truth to power. Okay, well, that's pretty much it for what I wanted to cover. Let me just go through these slides. These are my moral development references, some self-determination theory references, and more. And finally, before I finish, um, I, I must acknowledge the work of people who, for whom I've collaborated, in particular, um, Clark Cunningham at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Rachel Field at Bond in uh, the Gold Coast, Sally Hughes, with whom I'm currently writing a book which is designed to help us to prepare students to meet the challenge of a corrupt environment, and uh, to whom I am also married. And finally, Caroline Strevens at Portsmouth University in the UK. Um, I, I think we are faced with some tough challenges, but like Natalie, I, I remain optimistic. I've argued a lot for experiential learning and clinic, and I just want to finish with um, a, an experience just last week, which was great. I had a supervision session with one of my students who's been taking an employment tribunal case. And he had a tricky case where the employer argued that the, his client wasn't actually an employee and this matter was coming up at a preliminary hearing. All I can say is that in spite of the employer bouncing new issues in, just before the hearing, he did a brilliant job with it. And the matter is now going ahead to a full two day hearing where he'll be representing his client in full. Can I say that the satisfaction of working with students like that, doing what they do for the clients who are really in need is absolutely perfect. So that's the uh, end of my presentation. And I'm gonna stop the sharing now. and Hope that I've left a little bit of time for questions. Thank you, everybody. Many thanks, Nigel. It was wonderful. So there is time for questions, just a little bit of time for questions. And so could I invite to put questions in the chat box? And whilst those questions are coming through, could I, as, as, as before, exercise my prerogative and pose at least some of the questions I've got? And, and most of my questions are really about the first part, Nigel, of what, 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 what you were talking about. Um, would, it, would it be fair to say um, that one, one thing you were saying is this, that sometimes, so stu law students have got these high levels of stress, and quite often it's not because of the law, it's not even about, it's not just, it's not even about fears of you know, getting a job later, it's because we, in the way we design legal study, we have built in needless sources of stress. So, I mean, one example that went through my mind is, going back to the beginning of my teaching career, so going, going back several in, or two employers, I remember we had a conversation and I said, we should explain to students the sorts of things that will help them to, to do well in an exam. One of my colleagues said, no, <laughs> That's, that, that would go against academic rigour. So that might be one example. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of examples. I'm sure, I'm sure the scope to go systematically through what we do. I mean, another example might be that we insist on students working as individuals all the time, whereas they would probably benefit intellectually, socially, emotionally from working collaboratively. But I'm sure you could, you know, you, you could compile a whole list of things. So maybe one thing you're saying is that we would need to do a sweep of 
not uh, uh, how we do law, legal education, and make uh, and just pick out all the bugs that we have inserted into it. I I'd, I'd agree with that, Michael, and I think you give you some some wonderful examples. Um, your first example, we shouldn't explain to the students how to answer these questions because that damages academic rigor. I, I don't think it's got anything to do with academic rigor. I think it's an, about an attitude towards students that's uh, fundamentally damaging. It's cheating. It's trying to trick them up. And if we're trying to trick our students up with our assessments, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Um, your, your other example about individual and collaborative work, um, I think this is a, a very complex area and a very tricky one, and we'll be all aware of the issues around plagiarism and so on that uh, that have an impact on it. Um, it seems to me that most individuals, once they get into practice, will work collaboratively most of the time. And therefore that's one of the things that should be part of what we assess. And they should learn to value it. But at the same time, I do want to see that that student has the personal capacity to do whatever it is that they might need to do. It's not just them being assessed as a collaborator, it's them being assessed as an individual as well. So I'm all in favor of um, smaller uh, assessment tasks, but perhaps more diverse assessment tasks. Um, I, I don't know what your, um, your law school's experience is, but increasingly where I've been acting as an external, um, I've been finding that there are diverse assessments, not purely, I mean, it's a long time since I've seen something which has been purely assessed by the three hour papers that I was assessed in, the three hour unseen papers. But I don't think there's no, no, no place for that. It may well be that that is a part of what the assessment should be. Um, so I would, I would encourage diversity in assessment. Thank you. Uh, Esther Erlings, Dr. Esther Erlings, a question also on the first part. You talked about autonomy and allowing students to choose their essay title. Could you expand on that? Is the idea here that that of students writing a research paper on a topic of their own choosing, or is this something we can e.g. apply to problem scenarios? Um, I, thank you for that question, and that is a good one. Um, I've seen it in the context of essay titles rather than problem scenarios. Um, I've not encountered it in the context of problem scenarios. I think that might might prove difficult. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's difficult, isn't it, to actually produce a good problem that genuinely gets the issues without suggesting the answers and um, ensuring that we, we get students to really think about the law and perhaps, um, particularly in the context of my, our students, the evidence that um, is, is key to answer them. So, no, I, I had in mind essay questions and in the examples I've, I've seen, there have been a number of key areas of the curriculum which the law staff identified to the students. And the students then had to come up with a challenging essay title within one of those areas of the curriculum. So they, they had a certain amount of choices to, as to what they actually chose to study. Sorry, not to study, to, um, to be assessed in and the nature of the task, but that had to be negotiated with the assessor. So they would have to justify why they thought their essay title raised a serious problem that was worth exploring. And that was an incredible learning activity in its own, in its own right. So that, that's the sort of thing I had in mind. Thank you. Uh, now we've, well, we've got a question from Natalie, but also we've only got about a minute and then we need to move on. Uh, so Natalie says, how do we overcome the fierce competitiveness that students experience in law schools, aided by inherently adversarial, inherently adversarial nature of law. I, I don't know, Latterly, but this I think we can do. Um, if we can draw students' attention to the fact that there are two things going on. One is that they are learning, and for that, 
cooperative working is almost certainly going to be helpful. And my, my experience of working with peer review exercises is that the person providing the peer support probably gains more from it than the person receiving it. And that that coexists with the fact that they are entering a competitive environment, which itself will contain large areas of cooperation. But in order to prepare yourself most effectively for passing the exams, for doing them as well as possible, a cooperative approach is almost certainly more valuable than a narrowly competitive approach. In other words, you actually learn from helping people. Nigel, uh, Natalie, just uh, one little comment from Natalie. Maybe you could encourage autonomy by getting students to write the problem question themselves to demonstrate their understanding of the issue. The students writing their own writing problem. Nigel, but we have to finish. So thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. It was great. It'd be nice to carry on the conversation, but we simply can't just now. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. Really, really appreciate it.